for someone who's never done breath work before and when you do like a session for the first time with them yeah what happens like what 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 do they say what is that experience like walk, mm. walk us through that yeah i mean there there are many layers um, working with a a first timer when it comes to breath simply because a lot of times when someone's interested uh, it's either because they're curious because they heard about it or um, <clears throat> they've tried many other type of modalities to work through a lot of the limitations or challenges or really, um, if you will, uh, really deep, painful things that they're, they're experiencing. And then someone recommends that they do breath work or, you know, um, essentially <clears throat> they they hit a bump in the road they hit a crossroad where it's like, okay, I've tried everything and nothing else has worked. So I'm going to try this. So when someone's coming uh, for me, I'm more interested in like where they're at, but not just that, like, give me an understanding of everything that's been happening leading up to where you're at. Um, because the way I was trained my mentality, it's not a matter of just throwing somebody in the fire right away because they, they may actually do more harm than good. It's about, it's about warming them up and creating as much context of what they're going to expect moving into it. Because, you know, breathwork has been out. I mean, the idea of breathwork itself, because it's becoming a trend and a thing, uh, has been happening for a while. But, you know, we're born and the first thing we do is we gasp for air. So, you know, breathwork itself, it's, it's a part of us. It's just... We've created this idea and certain, you know, breathing styles to make it its own category. But beyond all of that, it's it's really just being able to breathe deeply and get present. So in a session, I take people through understanding where they are, setting context for what to expect. Because <clears throat> up until that point for a first timer, this is what I've learned after working with hundreds of people. The common denominator for why someone is coming to a breathwork session is because a lot of the elements of what they're dealing with, they have created, not consciously, but unconsciously created mechanisms for where they get to escape and avoid, right? <clears throat> so if I'm guiding with this modality that is going to pull you into the present, I have to be able to create as much context and create the conditions that are going to be safe enough for you to know, okay, this is expected. This is what's going to take place. If you feel this, just keep breathing. If this happens, just keep leaning into it. Because the reality is when we're breathing in certain ways, it's a proving fact now it's known that we're pulled into the present. And the present for a majority of people is what we're trying to escape from. You know, everyone talks about, oh, be present and just be present. It's, it's simple, but it's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that easy. Simply because a lot of people that I work with, and I work with a wide array of people, but when you're talking about like, like a typical deep breathwork session, a lot of people have trauma that's, that's unprocessed. And the trauma, the event is usually not the issue. It's everything else that we either create about the event or the narrative that we create about the event or the things that we don't or are not in the place to process from the event that actually gets stuck in our body. So what happens is now there's this trauma that we experienced. And because of our inability to be able to process it for a number of reasons, it now becomes frozen in us. So most people are living, right, it, with and from a frozen past in the present. So what they're typically doing is repeating the past over and over again in the present. But you got to think about it. The degree of the event that took place for a lot of people who did not have the resources to be able to process or be with it says that it was very challenging right, in whatever way, shape, or form. So it was very challenging then. The last thing we want to do is repeat it now. 
So we do everything in our power not to be present with the things that are actually in us. You see what I mean? So, so, so when you're, does that, so when you start doing breath work and you become present, does all of that come back? Not that, the all. things that we've been avoiding. Such a good question. So it, it comes back in layers and it's different for everybody. <clears throat> mm -hmm. It's different okay. for everybody. It comes back in layers. As a matter of fact, it's always looking to surface. It, it, and I, I, would, I, would act, I would actually put it even more eloquently, like it's not coming back, it's already here. We're just, we just avoid it, mm -hmm. right? We push it away and it shows up in a myriad of ways. For instance, you know, one of the beautiful things about the breath is that not only does it make us present, but it gets us out of what we're used to being in, which is our heads. And it pulls us into the body. And contrary to popular belief and popular, you know, uh, understanding, we've we've been conditioned and programmed to solely focus on like the head and the brain and thinking and logic and reason, which has a time and place. But essentially, we're also living, we're leaving a whole nother world of ourselves behind. And if we look at ourselves like physiologically and biology, um, uh, through our biology, we have something called the vagus nerve. And this is also part of what why breath is powerful because this is the nerve. That vagus, gets, like Las Vegas? Like vague, yes, but it's V-A-G-U-S. But just oh, it's, pronounced, okay, okay. it's pronounced that way. We have the vagus nerve, which is one of the biggest nerves in the body. And it's the principal function of our parasympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> So for those who are familiar with the nervous systems, like just kind of keep it really basic, you have the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight system, right? This is the system that uh, comes online and gets engaged when we sense a danger or a threat. So our body instinctually kicks, the system kicks in in order to protect us, right? And then we have the other side of that. This is the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the rest and digest system. This is the system that, you know, senses, okay, when there's no danger, I can rest, I can relax, I can recover, I can heal, right? So this vagus nerve is the principal function of that system. Well, that system um, or the nerve is comprised of two fibers. The first fiber is, is an eff efferent fibers with an E. And efferent fibers are essentially signals, information, and data that are sent from the brain to the body. <clears throat> then we have afferent fibers. These are signals that are sent from the body to the brain. Well, the ratio between efferent and afferent fibers is 80 to 20. It's 80% information that's coming in is actually coming in through our body that's being passed mm -hmm. in the brain. So here we are in a society that's prioritizing thinking, logic, reason, which has a time and a place, but biology says otherwise. It says that a lot of information is coming in through our senses, our sensations, our feelings, our emotions. But if you grew up in a household <clears throat> where you were told not to cry or not to show emotion, or if you grew up in an environment where it was dangerous for you to show emotion because it could have cost you your life, or it could have meant that love was pulled away from you, the last thing you're going to want to do is have any type of connection or relationship with your body in that way. So you're going to push that away. And you're going to go immediately to the head center and think. And all our mind is typically trying to do is protect us from what we've deemed a danger or a threat in our body. So with the breath, and now you can see why I set so much context, because for someone who hasn't faced trauma, or confronted their fears for, for decades, the last thing you want to do is throw them in the volcano of that. So you kind of want to ease them in. And <clears throat> why, why? What happens? What does that look like? Let's say you just throw them in the fire and everything just, <laughs> all their past dramas come back. What, yeah. what do they usually happen to that? Well, thankfully, I, I really haven't had that quite an experience. Be, you know, just typical nature. I'm like a, I'm like a slow starter. So I like to kind of warm myself up and that's kind of like what I bring into my work. But typically what would happen, cause I've seen it happen before is it could really destabilize the person. And um, 
it, it could look like somebody having some type of agency, even though the agency is not building like, let's say a healthy foundation, they still had some type of agency. Now that person can completely like lose that and mm -hmm. they can go in a shell. They can close off. They could actually, mm -hmm. you could actually re-traumatize the person, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, an example I, I typically use it's yeah. It's imagine putting your finger in a boiling hot pot of water. Well, your finger isn't prepared for that type of intensity. So you're going to pull it out immediately. Mm -hmm. So the same thing applies, you know, with this work, it, it really takes a deep level of care and, and honestly, like expertise to be able to like notice people and feel and sense because the last thing you may want or somebody needs in that moment is to bring up all their trauma. They may just need something small. Right. It could be just, yeah, it could be just, you know, I've, I've had clients say, you know, this is the first time I've cried in 40 years. Right. So, I mean, hearing a statement like that, it's like, obviously there's a lot of shit in there. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But if him releasing just that emotion can give him access to taking a step further in his life. Great. Not every, we don't need to, we don't need to bring it all up because there, we, there's so many layers to us, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it could be something that's needed in that moment for somebody to like move forward with. Yeah. Got him. Yeah. And if, if, if it's done properly <laughs> where the, you know, you set expectation yeah. and things like that, what does that look like? Yeah, that's a, another good question. So, you know, w just like, you know, one apple <laughs> is not going to make you healthy or, you know, a slice of cake is not going to make you unhealthy. It's, it's the consistency in the practice. So, you know, one session is not going to be the end all be all, but one session can provide access to connecting and relating with yourself in a way to where you begin to interact with, you know, parts of you that have been dormant or parts of you that have been frozen or parts of you that you've just unconsciously suppressed. So in a typical healthy session, you know, what it could look like is I'm, I'm guiding someone through just breathing. That's all they're doing. And they're getting in a flexible, hyper aware state where they're becoming present with everything that's taking place. So there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a number of things that happen. First, sensations are experienced in the body. So not only do we have a lot of people that aren't present, but we have a lot of people that are completely checked out and disassociated from their bodies. Most people are not in their bodies at all. So it can look like them really sensing. It's like, okay, do you feel tingles? Mm -hmm. Okay, feel what that feels like. Do you feel your temperature shift? Okay, notice what that feels like. Do you feel tension maybe in your chest or your shoulders? Okay, be with that. Do you feel uh, shakes or tremors? Okay, be with that. These are all, it's all information and data, right? And essentially, when we're operating from the mind, the first thing we want to do is like fix or figure out or solve. With a lot of this stuff as it relates to the body, there's really nothing to do except like be a witness to it, like let it pass mm -hmm. through. You know, I have two kids and they're the best teachers for me in this. Like when my five-year-old daughter is losing her shit, you mm -hmm. know, it's like, okay, let me just not try to control her. Let me not try to, you know, stop her from crying or having a tantrum. This is something that I had to learn. Let me make sure she doesn't hurt herself or anybody else, but let me just witness her. And before you know it, in a few moments, she's cried, she screamed, she's yelled, she's let it out. And then it's like, it didn't happen. It's mm -hmm. done. And then we have a conversation about what she felt and what took place. So she can have a reference, right? So she can have, start to develop a vocabulary for what that was. So if it does happen again, she now has, right, an internal, I would say, log of information. So she's not taking over by it. You mm -hmm. know, she kind of has a sense of being able to modulate and control it in a way. So people are going through the layers of just sensations. And then they may start to experience like feelings. 
<clears throat> and then they start to experience emotions. For many people, this can be in, in it could be intense. So, you know, the context, the space, the pace, the care, um, the depth, all of it matters for the person to feel an element of safety that allows them to process or be with things that they couldn't outside of those spaces. So after a session like that, when they experience that, you know, they can't unexperience it. Like now they know they could feel those emotions. So now they know they have connection with their body in their way. Now they know like, oh, they know what like tremors feels like, or they know what anxiety feels like without wanting to escape it, or they know what fear feels like, or they know what joy or anger feels like without needing to judge it. So the journey after that one is to continue a practice of like now being with themselves. And how I like to, the example I like to use is imagine trying to live life from outside of the vehicle that you were meant to live life in, right? You really don't have a point of reference. It's like somebody telling you about the movie that you never saw. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, okay, sure. It's like, great. I love that you like it, but I haven't seen it yet because I haven't experienced it. But now when people start to get a taste of what that's like and they're invited back into their body, the relationship they have to life is a lot different because now they're a bit more present than they were, mm -hmm. you know? But during the session. Yeah. So you, you're talking about like after the session. I'm talking about after. Yeah. So during the session, you're feeling all these emotions and feeling like, and, and by the way, is that similar to like, let's say, you know, like, let's say your daughter at that moment when she's crying, right? Yes. You're like, stop crying. Let's say you, you stopped her and then she was like, oh, she, she suppressed it. Right. And then let's say 20 years later, she's doing like breath work. Is that, is that, is that the same emotion from back then coming out almost? That's such a good question. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to say, I don't know, but I also mm -hmm. say possibly, mm -hmm. right? Just because we have so many layers and so many memories and so many experiences that have that have been lodged and logged into right our fascia into our dna that it could be a number of things but is that a possibility absolutely i've had many sessions where that was the case and people have vivid memories of a childhood experience mm -hmm. that was very traumatic for them so Got it. um something else that's powerful about it is like in those experiences where people have those memories for example Let's say that my daughter, 20 years later, were to have an experience and a memory of me that was very tough for her where I told her, stop crying. Well, because I told her, stop crying, doesn't mean that those tears went anywhere. They remain stuck mm -hmm. in her. <clears throat> so now she's living from this suppression of expression of her tears that's essentially affecting how she's showing up in her life. She's really not being herself because I prevented her from doing that. Now, 20 years down the line, she's in a session, a somatic session, a breathwork session, and that memory comes up. What's powerful about that is she now has the opportunity to complete that by possibly crying in that moment. What I didn't let her do or what she couldn't do 20 years previously, she now has the opportunity to do it 20 years later. Mm -hmm. But the magic about that is when we're present, Time doesn't exist. So for her, it feels like it was 20 years ago. She's just experiencing it now. Mm -hmm. And that's usually what takes place. It's like in the present moment, when people get hyper present, they lose the concept of time. All they know is, oh, I'm five years old and I remember my dad leaving. Mm -hmm. Right? Even though you're 40 years old, even though you're 40 years old, and it happened 35 years later, you're still living as that five-year-old yeah. child until you have an opportunity to like complete it. And then you can move forward. Yeah. And then let's say, uh, let's say she had that session and then she left. Mm -hmm. how, how, how is her life different? Like how, yeah. how, how is the rest of her day different? <laughs> very, very, very good question. And this is, this is what really calls for it, like integration. Um, and this is where majority of my work is a lot of, you know, a lot of time it's like, oh yeah, I'm in the session with them, but it's, it's really after. 
And the reason why post session or just post anything that's related to a peak experience is more important than the session itself is because coming into the session, I'm going to use the, the example of my daughter that you brought up. When I told her to stop crying, chances were that she decided to start to adapt and create a persona that was going to be more likable by me. So she stopped being herself in that moment when she was five. But the thing is, the moment she chose to do that, that persona or that character or that identity is now who she's living in the world. So from five years old, she became someone different. So coming into the session, they are the persona. In the session, they come to terms with realizing like, oh, I chose to be that because my dad didn't like my emotion. And I only did that to accept my father's love and validation and recognition. So now the choice after the session <clears throat> is to choose to live as themselves. And what that could look like now is practicing, practicing, like it, it really takes practicing, practicing the sense of self that they didn't allow themselves to be when they were five. So that can look like when they do feel emotion come up, you know, it's, it's knowing that it's okay. It's informing, you know, the people that are part of their life that they're used to them being a certain way. Like, hey, this is what took place and this is what I realized, right? I've not really been being myself because at five years old, you know, I was told this and it made me this character that y'all are all used to, but that's not really me. So that person now goes on a journey of like change and transformation and growth in a direction that's different than the persona. That's why it's most important because that's actually not easy. You're not going to be working and fighting against the currents <clears throat> of this identity that you built. And this identity, you didn't just build it, but this identity has created friendships, it's created relationships, it's created, you know, <clears throat> it's created a world. Now, all of a sudden, you realize that, oh, I, I can't afford to be that anymore because it was connected to a wound. It was connected to a, a trauma. And when you begin healing, you know, that's a word that's thrown around a lot. So I'm just going to kind of quote unquote it. When you begin healing, healing essentially is becoming whole again. That's all it is. So when dad said, stop crying, you split yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you began living one-sidedly to be accepted by your dad. And now when you realize, oh, I left a, a huge part of me behind. Well, the healing process, it's like, well, I got to start practicing the part of myself that I suppressed because my dad didn't like it. So now that's going to look like possibly, you know, um, like losing or shifting out of what everyone is used to, what you're used to. And that's what takes time. That's essentially what transformation is too, is just shifting identity. Yeah. So is that practice like, let's say, Let's say as an adult, she's at work yeah. and her boss says something to her and she's, yeah. she's, she feels that emotion again, but like, let's say normally she would just suppress that and try to yes. not cry or whatever it is. Yes. yes. But would that look like at that moment, instead of doing that? Yes. Just, so what happens? Like, like then at that point, does she have to be aware and then just let yes. it out? <laughs> okay. Such, such a, I love that you use like the work environment as well. Because um, it's different for everybody. Now, what I would definitely tell people, uh, and, and a part of this too is, once you're reconnecting with your emotions, it's, or this part of you, it's learning how to contain it. Hmm. Not, not imprison it, but contain it. So containing can look like, all right, I'm at work and my boss said something that was pretty what I consider unprofessional. And it brings up, again, it not only brings up these emotions, but it brings up what it felt like to be told by my father when I was five. So now that I'm aware that this emotion is here, I look around, oh, I, I look into my environment and I can see that this may not be the place to express it. Mm. So, you know, 
I allow myself to choose that. Work may not be the place to do it. Or mm -hmm. maybe I do need to excuse myself and go to the bathroom mm -hmm. and go let it out, right? Because I can't afford to actually hold it. If I hold it, it's not going to be good for anybody around me. Or if I can, I now give myself a healthy space outside of work to do so, right? Or if I can, and this is, this is the next level of it, right? I'm aware of this emotion and what's happening. I now listen to it. I, I pay attention to where it is existing in my body. So, okay, cool. It's in my chest. There's like tightness in my chest. All right. Well, maybe I can breathe with it. All right. Maybe I can. Okay. What is it? What does it need right now? In that state, maybe I can now transform it into something else. You know, it doesn't always have to be expressed how we're used to. It can also be transformed into a different type of energy. But the biggest thing here is not doing what we normally would do, which is suppressing or escaping or trying to act like it, it's, it, yeah, it doesn't cool. happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so being aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. If you transform it, what does that look like? What, what would, let's say, what would be one example of like transforming that crying into something else? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it all matter. It, what, what really matters is, you know, if, if you can identify what the tears are a response of. So it could be sadness. Just being sad, yeah. It could be sadness. And, you know, again, if you're in an environment where that's not the place, that may not be something you can transform, right? Or the tears could be, you know, it could be really intense and they could, you could, it could be anger underneath there. Mm -hmm. You know, anger is just unintegrated power, essentially. So, you know, without causing harm to anybody or causing harm to yourself. If you do have a break, you can literally like change that into like, go work out, mm -hmm. <laughs> go for a run. Or in a work environment, you could find something that has the equal amount of like intensity. So let's say like you need to like complete a task and you need it like energy, mm -hmm. right? What, I, what that could look like is breathing with that energy in a way that you can now shift it and put it into something in a more productive way. But I will say just because it's transformed doesn't mean that it's complete in that way. It doesn't mean that once you leave work, residue of it won't be there, right? It's a matter of awareness and presence. That's it. Awareness and presence. And the awareness is just about noticing, like noticing what is happening, noticing where it's happening. Yeah. Yes. And how it's taking place in you. And the second level of awareness is your ability to contain it. Then the presence is your ability to be with it without judging it. And we've lived in a world where, you know, because we expect things to be a certain way or whatever the status quo says, a human is we we've judged ourselves a lot you know we've judged our emotions and emotions don't really they're not categorized on either scale of good or bad they're just information you know some emotions are constructive and some are destructive it's mm -hmm. a matter of perspective and choice based on the individual and what's required for them in that moment to set them straight in whatever path they're meant to take. But when we remove the judgment, then what we realize is like, oh, this is just an invitation for my humanity. That's, I'm a human being that experiences emotions. Mm -hmm. I'm not my emotions. I experience them. And that's a big, that's a big thing that takes yeah. place as well. But yeah. So let's yeah. say I did that. So yeah, it sounds like kind of like maybe so so you start judging yourself less every time those emotions yes. come up or something yes. and you just sit with it. Yes. And I'm assuming like when that happens, when you say uh transfer it, transform it or contain it, it's like like you can't get into your head again, right? At that moment you kind of have to just because sometimes I do that, right? Like I get really yeah. pissed off or some sort of emotions come up and I I I don't want to feel that way. So I keep myself busy by doing something else. Yes. Or something like that. 
Yes. So I shouldn't do that. <laughs> well, I wouldn't tell you you shouldn't do that. I mean, for you, mm -hmm. what I what I'm observing, um, if you don't mind me asking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a do you have a, a a time where that's recently happened? Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's you know what it is. It's usually it's a it's a it's this uncomfortable thing of like somebody judging me or people judging me, and it's almost like shameful. Like I can't believe yeah. it's, it's it's usually like oh, I can't believe I said that or I can't believe I did that or. Oh, now yeah. this person probably thinking this way about me, something like that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's so, like shame. shame. Yeah. It's a lot of shame, shame. Is the emotion I feel. Yeah. And and shame from your actions, right? Yeah. Something I did or I said or okay. something like that. Yeah. Now, is, is the shame coming from how they reacted or is it from yeah, the judgment usually. over? So, so, so like, yeah. let's say I, I said something. Like, I don't, I, I said something mean to my wife or something like that. Right. So, I mean, with my wife, I, I think we're, we're in a good place. So it's, yeah. it's, it's not as much, but it's usually with somebody that I'm not as close to. Yeah. Or like even strangers, like, let's say I said something on, on a social media post. Yeah. And maybe I was, maybe I, I misspoke or something like that. And it's my yeah. mistake. And I can recognize that it's my mistake, but I don't want to admit it. <laughs> and then yeah. people start commenting like, let's yeah. say like negative comments or even hateful comments or something like that. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, all these people hate me or all these people are judging me. Or, yep. And then there's people reading those comments and probably judging me. <laughs> yep. Yep. Something like that. So, you know, what's interesting about that is the shame that you, that you recognized from misspeaking to somebody, for instance, and not being able to bring yourself to a place of like admitting it still perpetuates the shame because of because of because of the you not addressing it so mm -hmm. there's this saying that what we resist persists and the resistance to the very thing is actually creating more mm -hmm. of it right you just you just express that as like I can't get myself to admit it, but then it's like more comments and more hateful things and mm. more hateful things. So like now, like the shame is intensifying. So in this example, would you say shame is, is something that you feel resistant to? Yeah, I think, I think whenever, cause the, the feeling is like, whenever somebody's judging me. Yeah. Or I feel like I'm being judged. The the feeling that I feel is shame. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's like the feeling that I hate the most. <laughs> yeah. And do you know where you feel it the most? If you were to kind of remember, like yeah, in your like body, here. in your chest, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> in those situations, you know, what I what I recommend is really my whole body becomes weak, like a noodles. Yeah. <laughs> So you like, you like, you almost like shut, you like shut down. Yeah. 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 Almost. But I, I, I think I've gotten really good at avoid like distracting sure. myself from that feeling. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, I don't have time to deal with this now. I gotta, you know what I mean? Something like that. <laughs> and it's so you, you say, I don't have the time to deal with this. Right. And you're not the only one. And it's almost like a learned behavior as in, oh, this makes me stronger as a businessman. Yes. I have to, you know what I mean? It's, it's almost yes. like, yes. Oh yeah. I, I, this is a skill that I've developed. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, we, we have, we have, there are many mechanisms that we, we have all of us. Um, because first things first, like we're wired for survival as humans. So what we deem painful, what we deem dangerous, what we deem a threat, we deem harmful um, we distance ourselves from in fact mm -hmm. we create tactics to avoid it at all costs um, this is one of the reasons why most people aren't present is because in the present there is a idea or a narrative that there's danger or there's something painful waiting for them so they create as many tactics and mechanisms around being present 
So in this case, <clears throat> what not being with it looks like is you overworking or you avoiding it through work, which if we step out of judgment for you doing that for just a bit and look at So if I were to have you to look at, okay, I'm wired for survival. And the last thing I want to do is experience pain. If you could understand that for a bit, then you know that your faculties, your mind is actually working for you. It's actually mm -hmm. trying to help you. And what it's trying to help you do is not feel the pain that you have associated as painful, which is shame. So it's going to support you in creating whatever mechanisms or protection mechanisms to avoid facing what it's deemed as painful. <clears throat> but I use this all the time. It's like I talk about the boogeyman, right? We fear the boogeyman not because we see what the boogeyman looks like. We fear the boogeyman because of the story we've created about the boogeyman. So the more we create a story about the actual thing, the more there's an opportunity for fear. And the more there's an opportunity for fear about a story, the more distance that's created between us mm -hmm. and the actual thing. And then you realize one day, I'm just going to take a look at the boogeyman. And you're like, oh, that was it? Mm -hmm. So in this case, what it can look like for you is when you notice that those sensations are arising, awareness <clears throat> the normal thing the normal knee-jerk reaction would be to oh i don't have time for this let me go look mm -hmm. for something to do yeah right so you okay let me catch myself for a bit. Go oh. turn on the computer yeah let me go <laughs> yeah let me go escape this. Let, me go, let me go be busy for a yeah. little bit right let me go be busy what i'd recommend is like take a breath like normally it's like consciously interrupt the reaction let me interrupt my need to turn on the computer. And let's say, let's say today you didn't turn on your computer right away and you just took a breath. That's a win because you didn't react as fast as you normally would. The next day it happens. You didn't turn on your computer. You took a breath and you actually decided to like take a walk and really start to like be with this. And then you eventually go to the computer. <clears throat> That's a win. Notice like we're slowly getting close mm -hmm. to this thing, right? Because for you, it, could, it may not be wise to just immediately jump into it. But eventually the place we want to get, get to is listening and feeling the tension. So what I invite people to do when, <clears throat> when there's tension uh, uh, present is can you welcome the tension that you're experiencing just for this moment. That's it. There's nothing you have to do with it. There's nothing you have to fix about it. There's nothing you have to solve about it. There's nothing you have to, no, just. just you almost have to look at it as a positive thing. It, not, not even yeah. positive. You just be with it. <laughs> no judgment. No, let me just be with it. Right. And you may notice the intensity. It's like, oh, mm. everything in your body is fighting. And it's like, okay, breathe. Mm. And just breathe your way through the layers of the tension. And you may meet again parts that may come up. You know what hap usually happens if I sit with it? Yeah. I start overthinking it. So yes. I immediately goes, I go to my head. Yes. And I'm like, oh, I should have done this instead. Oh, but the and then I yes. start analyzing <laughs> the situation. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Yes. By so the I shouldn't way, do that. Uh, that's another way of escaping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> when I when I tell you like this is working <laughs> over time to make sure that we don't experience it, yes. So yeah. it's and <clears throat> you remember the conversation we were just talking about as it relates to the persona and the mm -hmm. the identity. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an there's the potentially there's an identity you have around not feeling shame. Mm -hmm. So what takes place is the ego-driven identity that's built her persona as son who only shows up this way, who only thinks this way, who only feels this way, you know, is being challenged by the possibility of allowing himself to actually feel this. 
you know and it's it's more about the story that yeah. that yeah it's more about the story i think it's uh yeah just just to correct you like yeah. i don't think it was it's shame okay it's, it's judge to the outside world yes it's like judgment right like oh yeah i'm i'm you can't hurt me type of thing yeah but inside what i feel is the same emotion as shame does yeah. that make sense like yeah so i don't think from the i don't think i'm trying to show the world that i don't feel any shame like yeah. but i'm trying to show the world that i don't feel judged. like I, I don't care about you judge i don't care what you say i don't care yes. what you think yes. kind, of, kind of thing yeah. yes question for you hmm. is that true like i i don't care what they think that part no yeah. no of course not <laughs> <laughs> I care a lot. <laughs> right? And, and I think that's why I feel the shame. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so the 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 judgment you care about externally could be also connected to the judgment you have of yourself, ideally. Yeah. I, sh I feel shame from myself. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Or you're... you're so what should I do at... So let's yeah. say I, I feel that. And yeah. I, I can feel it here. Yeah. And I'm like, start, and my start, my start to over overthink about the, a, analyze that situation. Yeah. At that moment, what, what should I do? How how should I get out of my head? Uh, b breathe. <clears throat> it's so what it can look like. It's nothing crazy. It's it's bringing your attention and focus back to your breath. Uh, a breathing style that I I love to recommend all the time is is super simple. It's coherent breathing, which is. You know, obviously making sure that you're either seated, seated or you're standing or what, wherever you're at, just make sure you're safe. And it's a simple breath in through the nose for four to six seconds and then slowly out the nose for about four to six seconds. Some of the benefits of that breathing style outside of not just being able to like calm your body or calm your system or calm the 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 angst that's that's taking place in your system is that when you start to go in your head and overthink right the body's also responding so when you feel tension in your chest you know your breath actually becomes more shallow you're not really breathing yet like you're breathing mm -hmm. yeah your breathing matches the state that you're in so the state is like okay you start to overthink about the situation. Now your heart rate could be increasing, mm. right? So the body is is almost in a way getting like stressed, right? It's some type of stress response that's taking place. Again, it's back to that fight or flight. Mm. Like when I feel this, do I either shut down, do I run, or do I want to fight? So the breathing um, helps really and it's not really about calming it's more about it's more about uh, uh centering it's more about presence so the breathing gets you out of your head and back here now once you're back here and you feel the tension the question that i asked before can you welcome what you're feeling in this moment and let's say the answer is no because it's too intense like, okay, you notice there's resistance. Okay, can you welcome the resistance to what you're feeling right now? Okay, no. All right, there's more resistance. Can you welcome the resistance to the resistance? Mm -hmm. So you see where I'm, what I'm doing? See, the thing is, it's not a matter of fighting. It's a matter of allowing and meeting yourself at whatever layer you're at. Typically, what we'll do is we'll fight. It's like, uh, like... I need to figure this out. I need to fight. I need to, I, I, I want to solve this. No, it's, let me, oh, okay. Let me meet myself here. Mm -hmm. Okay, did that door open up? Okay, great. Let me meet myself even more. And what you'll realize that you will start to possibly feel the tension dissolve. It may or may not dissolve that time or it could dissolve another time. But you want to breathe with it. And with breathing, again, you remember we're being pulled to the present. So the overthinking or the going to the computer, again, that's a way to avoid the present. And if you could just keep breathing and feeling or sensing the tension and being without, without judgment, 
you may have data and information come up to inform you about why you know you feel shame or why you feel judgment about yourself and from that now you can make an informed decision to support yourself as opposed to going back to what you normally would do, which is avoiding it. Um, and it, 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 it could be, it could be scary. It's not a, it's not an easy thing to do because, you know, we're, we are also, we're also battling essentially like ourselves, but the cells that we're battling is not really the real one. It's, it's the, it's the mask. It's the persona. It's the, it's the identity that's already gotten social benefit. It's already gotten a sense of belonging. It's already, you know, it's, that's who we think we are, but it's not us. Like who we really are is the, is, is the part that we're avoiding. So it takes courage to lean into those scary places and just allow yourself to feel. But once you do, then you'll realize that the judgment was only an invitation to come back to you. So son judging himself, right, or misspeaking, right, created the judgment, but the judgment was a way to come back to you. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So right? wh when you say supporting at that moment, instead of avoiding it, you, you're supporting yourself. Yes. What does that look like? What's an example of me supporting myself? Like, yes. do you know what I mean? Ask like, let's say, yeah, let's say somebody judge. Let's say somebody left a, <laughs> you know, negative comment or something yeah. like that. And I'm like, you know, like I was like, shit, like, yeah. Um, I maybe I feel like at that moment, if I get triggered, I feel the need to like <laughs> explain myself or like, yeah. um, or maybe just like like I, that's what i used to do actually i would go yeah. into these like yeah back and forth battles with strangers on the <laughs> and then yeah. i kind of stopped doing that yeah and that was me avoiding it it's like oh yeah. let me just turn this off and right yeah. and then um uh, let's say and that's avoiding it sounds like and let's say i i'm like okay i'm just gonna sit with this i do my breathing mm. and then and then what happens after okay. that this Let's is, see. I, this, I, this is good. I, I'm sitting. I'm, yeah. I'm going to share. I'm going to share a story. So, yeah. um, for a lot of my life, um, I wore a lot of masks. Uh, one as a perfectionist. Uh, one as a people pleaser. <clears throat> one as a hero and a savior. Um, what other masks did I wear? The overachiever. In some cases, the conformist, like I wore a lot of masks, like I would shape shift in and out of different environments. And a big reason for creating these masks or these identities, which again, how it affected me in the world is I was very shy, I was timid, I was reserved, I was quiet, you know, and there are benefits to some, some ways of that. But based on what was happening in my life and the results that I had, like it really was not helping me. But the reason for that was I was criticized a lot as a kid, like a lot. Growing up in a very strict right, household, I was criticized a lot. So at a very early age, I picked up that, oh, in order for me to feel loved and accepted, like I got to make sure that other people are happy. Or in order to feel loved and accepted, I got to make sure that you know, like this is perfect. Or in order to feel loved and accepted, I, I, I have to like be a certain way. And it was all to one, gain love from my environment, gain love from my parents and gain acceptance. But the real reason I, I really wore these masks was because I was preventing other people from seeing the parts I had shame about. Mm -hmm. So these masks are a form of protection because <clears throat> sometime when I was a child, when I was being full Samson, mm -hmm. I was being myself fully, that was not enough for my parents. And they needed me to be something else in order for them to feel good. 
So I adopted to be that. In fact, I'll share even a bit more of my story. So I was born Samson. That was my birth name. And when I was a year and a half, <clears throat> my mom tells me a story when we lived in London, because that's where I was born, at a dining table, that, like, you remember when people used to c collect, like, you know, the the chinaware and the, yeah, so. I mean, people still do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super old school, right? Super yeah. traditional, yeah. right? So she told me a story about, like, this crystal wine glass that uh, we had. And she said, I literally, I grabbed it and it didn't like, I didn't throw it. I didn't slam it. I just grabbed it and it cracked in half. And she got really intimidated and scared. She was like, okay, like what the heck is going on? Up until that point, they said, every time they called me Samson, I'd be like hype. I'd be hyper. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be charged up. And she said after that day, we stopped calling you Samson. And these were her words. I actually, I, I asked her about the story again, maybe like nine or 10 months ago. And these were her words. She's like, your power was too much for us. Mm -hmm. So at a year and a half old, <clears throat> I internalized that, oh, I'm too much for my parents. Mm -hmm. So let me dumb myself down. Right? So all these masks and all these ways that I'm not being myself is a way for me to prevent further harm or rejection. So when someone judges me or reacts to how mm -hmm. I show up and it irritates something in me, it's really not irritating me. It's actually irritating the persona that mm -hmm. I I, I'm, I'm presenting to the world. The work that I had to do and I had to do for other people was going to these places that we would normally avoid because that's where we can actually bring back ourselves into wholeness. So for instance, what I had to learn to do was accept that I was like just enough. It was too much for my parents, but it was right for me. Mm -hmm. And I had to allow myself to start to be my energetic, lively, passionate, intense self, regardless of who, as long as I'm not being disrespectful or harmful to anybody, right? Regardless of who accepts it or not. And the moment I accept that, let's say someone says you're intense or you're this or you're that, it doesn't affect me anymore because I've accepted it. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to that is you mean like when when somebody says that you would have to like you would get triggered and then you would have to let's say do breathing and stuff <clears throat> calm yourself down but you wouldn't yes. even have to do that like when somebody says that it just doesn't has no effect yes so right there's from a, the get -go. yes yeah there's a process that i do it's called trigger to freedom and it's, mm -hmm. it's it, i love that you're bringing this up so in this example someone comments let's say a not so good comment mm -hmm. towards you yeah and the first thing you want to do is like defend it like oh yeah. samson you're an asshole no i'm not yeah. i'm not an asshole yeah. how dare you call me an asshole like yeah. i'm so irritated and turned off by that yeah. there's two things first thing is as a human i do have the capacity to be an asshole second thing is it's either I'm an asshole in that moment or I'm not. Hmm. Notice, I didn't deny being an asshole. It's more about was I being an asshole in that moment hmm. or not. <clears throat> when we can learn that as humans, we have the capacity to be everything, that's when we won't be as emotionally charged when people call us things or judge us. And this actually has happened many times, specifically around being called an hmm. asshole. There was a friend, we were having a conversation. This happened about like two or three years ago. And I was being direct, <clears throat> being honest. I'm usually that way. But I think based on where they were at, they didn't expect it as direct as they got it. Mm -hmm. And they immediately turned to calling me an asshole. Samson, bro, mm -hmm. you know, you're being a fucking asshole. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, it was like, ooh, <clears throat> it was like, 
and I took a breath. Mm -hmm. I took a breath. And this is after I had already like, you know, been growing in that area. And I said, you know something? Um, you're right. I do have the capacity to be an asshole, but I'm not, an, I'm not being an asshole right now to you. And there was something about my response that grounded them and made them more open to be receiving of my feedback. The old me would have defended that. Why? Because I'm a people pleaser. Mm. Because I'm a perfectionist. Mm. A people pleaser can be an asshole. If I'm an asshole, I'm not making mm. you happy. So if I'm not mm. making you happy, I can't get what I want. So that's the thing. When we can accept that we, we have positive qualities, but also the negative ones, that's when these judgments won't really have an effect on us. They may affect us, but they won't really affect, we won't take it as personal because we can see that, yeah, I could be an asshole or I could be evil or I could be manipulative or I could be, I could be brash or I could be jealous or I could be envious or I, I can lie, I can cheat, I can steal. I've done all those things as a human being, son. And for me to like not accept that would be hypocritical. For me to perpetuate this, this guru-like perfect, no, people- How long did it take you? Yeah, good question. To, from, from like, like you can't control that to, to yeah. a point where you're like, you know what? Yeah, yeah. I can't be an asshole. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it happened over the years and it happened in layers, but it can happen as quick as right now. And why I say that is because all it takes, not it's all, but I'm not saying that like it's, it's easy. All it takes is to confront the parts of you that is having you deny that you're an asshole. And which, if you get close to it, you realize it's connected to the persona of the mask. And if you get close to that, you realize that persona or a mask is connected to some sort of wounding in the past that caused you to be that persona or a mask, right? And a lot of this had to do with like, you know, some like being with my little boy, the little boy that was criticized a lot and like, you know, working with accepting and letting him know that, you know, we're good and you're good and, you know, you can trust me and I, and I got you. You know, people call that inner child work. Um, a lot of that had to do with also practicing, accepting that I could be an asshole. And it's not so much about, you know, boasting about being, you know, uh, unkind or being an asshole. No, it's about knowing your capacity for it, but choosing otherwise. Right? Knowing your capacity for it or choosing, choose it, choosing it otherwise. For, for instance, like the work that I do with men, some of it is, is teaching and reminding men to accept that they can be dangerous, right? They can be, and for the people that's listening to this, this is, you know, again, just be mindful of what's coming up in you as I say these words, but it's a reality. Like we all have a, not all, but I'm speaking specifically to men, but all men have an inner killer in them. Mm. But if you lived in a world that's demonized that, or if you lived in a, in a household that demonized that, right? Then you hold shame mm -hmm. or you hold judgment around it. Because the reality is if someone were to break into your house right now and threaten your family, what are you going to do? Are you going to judge your inner asshole or inner killer or inner? No, you're going to have to do what's necessary to protect yourself and your family. So that's why. Now, those are extreme examples. But there are extreme examples that exist in the spectrum and range of what it's like to be a human. So the work necessarily would be, son, it's like, it's like okay, every time someone judges this or writes a, a whatever, a response to me, and they call me an asshole and I feel a little twinge, I feel something, you know, it's like, okay, what about that makes me feel this? Okay. And you may, it could be like, oh, well, 
because that wasn't my intention to be an asshole or, you know, um, that's not who I am. That's not what people know me as. Okay, well, well, who are you then, really? And then you start to really, like, go through the layers of, of introspection and reflection. And you will get to a point where you'll see that, oh, I don't want people to see this about me because it can mean that people's judgment or image of me is gone. You know, a lot of what I'm working on currently right now is, is in the element of judgment. So I don't see this as an accident, right? But judgment on, on both sides of the scale. So we can either judge someone by placing them in the pit and demonizing them, right? So we place them below us. We look down on them. Oh, you're an asshole. You're evil. You're shit. Like all that. Like we're judging them down. Or we can place them on a pedestal above us and overly admire and glorify them. Right? Both of these sides are a split in perception. So when I'm judging somebody down and demonizing them, in this case, somebody calling you an asshole. So they're demonizing you. Right? There's two sides that's taking place. There's our perception and then there is perception, but I'm going to speak solely from ours. All right? Let's say, let's say we're, we're actually judging somebody down because I don't want to speak for somebody else. I'm going to speak for me. Let's say I am demonizing somebody for being evil, for being this, and I'm judging them. Well, all I'm seeing really is the side that they showed me, right? Because well, my, my ego or my ego-driven identity, my egoic mind will only let me see that because the side that they're showing me is also fitting and uh, uh, confirming and affirming the narrative about myself. If I look down on somebody, that means I automatically pedestalize myself. Mm -hmm. I place myself above them. So how dare you be an asshole because I'm this good, noble person. So my ego feels inflated because of that. But what I'm not seeing is the other side of them. The other side of them that's not negative. The other side of them that's actually good. It's actually, you know, kind. It's actually uh, uh, life affirming. The reason I demonize them is because to a point where I judge them, because I could just look at them and not be affected by them. But something about them is triggering me that I have to demonize them. And when I investigate that, what I come to find out is, oh, they are reflecting back to me what I rejected in myself. And because I reject it, because I hide from it, I project it and externalize it out. It's like hot potato. Like, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. This is too much for me. So uh, yeah, you're an asshole. I'm not an asshole. You are. So mm -hmm. I'm putting it on them so they can deal with it. But the reason it's triggering me is because what I project automatically gets reflected. So that person that I'm judging is essentially a mirror back to me. Mm -hmm. about me so what i would do essentially again everything that we've been talking about is go to those places there's a series of questions that i normally would ask about why this person is triggering and then essentially i'll get to the part of me that is denying what i see in them and myself and when that takes place because it don't it, it can only happen in the heart. When I'm judging, I'm in my head. Right? I'm in my mind when I'm judging. Right? It's straight up protection and attack. It's like I'm in my in my head. But when I can come to my heart and I see that, oh, I too possess this. In fact, I look over the series of my life. Me feeling arrogant is actually a way of being an asshole to people. <laughs> me feeling <laughs> pompous is actually a way of me being the same exact thing that I'm judging the other, other person for. The same thing on the flip side. When I pedestalize somebody and I'm looking up to them and I'm glorifying them and I'm like, I'm so in awe of them, I'm also denying what I see in them and myself. Like I, I can't fathom being able to accept those qualities that I see in that person, those positive qualities I see in that person in myself. 
So people like this normally are like the self-loathers, mm -hmm. the self-saboteurs. I was this person. I put many people on the pedestal because I held so much shame about myself. So mm -hmm. let me externalize this. There's no way I could be a good person. There's no way I could. No, let me externalize this on somebody else. And then I would always find disappoint. I would always meet disappointment when that person would, would show me their other side or when that person would actually do a not so positive quality. And I'm like, I'd be met with disappointment. And what it was is because I didn't see them as a human. I only saw the side that my ego wanted to see because it allowed me to yeah. keep the narrative about myself. So it's almost like you can't see somebody for they who they truly are. If yes. you're in, if you're like if you are not integrated with yourself, yes, you're gonna look at others only the parts, the parts that, that you want to see yeah. of them or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's lit it's the only the parts that are convenient for the narrative that you believed about yourself. You know, for and, me, and it's. So I th the asshole ex example doesn't work for me because I feel like um, I don't mind being called an asshole. <laughs> I, okay, so because like I feel like I've I've built this identity. Maybe yes, I have the mask of an asshole, so everybody already expects that <laughs> from me. So maybe that doesn't bother me. <laughs> yeah. So, but then one thing that does bother me is like when somebody thinks that I'm wrong. Yeah. Like. It, when somebody uh, judges my intelligence, yeah. that's the thing that trigger triggers me. Yeah. And then, so when I actually meet, like the people that I hate the most are intelligent people. <laughs> <laughs> and when I when I see people that are like really, yeah, kind of not trying to show off their intelligence and very like down, to, I I actually like do put them on those people on the pedestal. Yeah. Like. Why? Why is that? Why do you put those people on the pedestal? Maybe because I want to be like that. Like maybe those are the people that are like, for example, so smart, <laughs> but they don't they don't feel the need to prove they're smart or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And how would you describe that quality? Wise. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you when you look at the people who are probably on the opposite side of the spectrum, the people that you would perceive as flaunting and boastful about their intelligence, what is it about them that you don't that doesn't that activates you? Like, what is it about them that you don't like? I think it's like what you said about the things like, no, I'm smarter than you, or like that yeah, type yeah. of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So would you say you feel small around those people? No, because so usually, so let me, let me clarify. So yes. usually what would happen is I'll say something on social media, right? And it's something, it's a topic that I, I'm very knowledgeable in <laughs> and somebody will come and <laughs> comment and they'll be like, that's not necessarily true. Or like they'll, they'll find the one exception to what I said mm. and attack me for it saying that you don't know what you're talking about. That's mm. like, but I do know, actually, I just didn't say it there. <laughs> right, right. But I, I do, I already know what they know. Okay, yeah. But they're judging me for not knowing that thing, not knowing that I, I actually do know that thing, right? So then yeah. now I'm judging them back. Yeah. You're like, you are the one who's, <laughs> who don't know. <laughs> right. You're, you're the side of me. right, right. I know exactly what you mean. So when they when they perceive to share their opinion on something that you feel very confident and um, competent in, why is there a need? Like, is there a need to defend yourself and why? Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think that that's the mask that I'm wearing is that I've, I've advertised myself as like a know-it-all <laughs> that once that, that side, that mask is being attacked. That's when I feel triggered. Yes, like the, the like the how you advertise yes. yourself as like a nice guy. 
yes. <laughs> a good person. So then when somebody calls you an asshole, like for yes. me, that thing is my when somebody somebody attacks my intelligence, that's the thing that triggers me. They insult your intelligence. Okay. Yeah. So when someone insults your intelligence, what happens? What do you make that mean about you? Like it's like what when somebody's like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, for example, I'm like, I do know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So do you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yes, but there, there, that's an, that's like a, that's like, even the way you just shared is like an automatic defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what's, what are you it's, defending? Yeah. What are you defending? What don't you want people, because you said you've advertised yourself as a know-it-all. So mm -hmm. your storefront is know-it-all, but you know, what I'm observing and what I'm gathering is I, I, this is what I call it. It's like a, it's a storefront that's fragile because anytime that anybody pokes at it, it's like, Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It, there's, there's no, there's no solid foundation in it yet because you know, mm. it's still a cover. So you advertise yourself as a know-it-all because there could be a fear of people finding out what about you? Yeah. What don't you want people to know about you, essentially? That that I'm not, I guess, uh, that I might be wrong sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> if someone does it... Or like maybe I, I feel like my what I know is my bread and butter. Yeah, because like every one of my clients always call okay. me so, like sons of genius or son so smart or something like that. So as soon as I'm not that, it's like ah. there goes my career. <laughs> so you yes, <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yes. So your genius or your again the mask of the know it all is also tied to your survival. It's tied to your well being. It's tied to your livelihood. So the moment someone attacks your livelihood, it's like, well, you're attacking my well-being, so I have to defend that, right? Mm -hmm. But it's in like this, almost like my reputation or something. Yes. In this case, is that the truth, though? Like, is someone actually attacking your well-being? No. Okay. Like some, when somebody comments and say, you don't know what you're talking about. It's, yeah, no. Okay. So if we can agree to that, then it's like, okay, cool. Let me breathe through that layer. Because it's different. Okay. If you were being like attacked yeah. and your life was on the line, hell yeah, yeah. defend yourself. Okay. But here's the thing. The brain doesn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. In that case, it's like, oh, shit, this is a pit bull attacking me. So it's uh, gonna, I see what you mean. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's going to bring up the same type of defenses. Same type of defenses than it would when yeah. you were actually... Yeah, chased by a pit bull. Yeah. So okay, you're even survival. though logically I know that it's not true. Yes, for some reason, like I still it, emotionally. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, the thing is, when we are in a stress response, that could be a trauma response from something connected to our past. All rational faculties leave, like the part of the brain that yeah. helps us rationalize things out the window. It's now it's all instinct at that moment, like. When you're, when you're being chased by a wild animal, there's no time to think logically. Yeah. I need to get to safety. You know what I mean? So Sub, maybe subconsciously I'm thinking like, what if somebody I know see the, sees that comment? Ah, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. So if they see that comment, if yeah. they see that comment, son, what would you make that mean about you? Not what they would think, but what would you make that mean about you? Like maybe they'll believe that guy over me or something like, it, like, it, yes. Like, even though that guy is wrong, I do know yes. my shit. Yes. <laughs> you know, like, and if they believe that guy, what would you make that mean? What would happen? I mean, technically nothing, but the fear is something like, yeah, it, it, it would, it would ruin my reputation or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if your if your reputation is ruined, what would happen? Then my then people won't hire me. <laughs> and if people won't if people won't hire you, what would happen? <clears throat> then I, I would I would make no money. <laughs> if you make if you make no money, what would happen? Then yeah, I would be homeless. 
<laughs> so this may not be the entire yeah. reality, but yeah. in some way, shape, or form, do you see like the <clears throat> the catalyst or the fear of being homeless or not having your needs taken care of is is built has built layers mm, of yeah. of identities or layers of how you show up in the world to protect you from that. So my identity is I know it all. I know my shit. Like can't nobody tell me nothing. Like I know my stuff. But the moment somebody attacks that, it's not this that gets triggered. It's this that gets triggered. Oh mm -hmm. shit. I may lose clients. I may not get hired. If I don't defend this, people are going to think that I don't know my stuff and then nobody's going to hire me. Mm -hmm. But the thing is like, once we're once we're able to like ground and breathe and get back into our rationale, this is a random fucking person that you don't even know. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it's not about them, it's about what it brought up in you. Now, this could be this could be a stretch, but I would love to ask you this if 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 you're open to it. Yeah. Is there was there something around not being intelligent that you were criticized for in your life? Yeah, I mean, uh, I grew up in an Asian family, so. <laughs> and also, I never finished college. Mm. And I think that's like a, yeah, that's like a shameful thing. Like, especially like, well, shameful especially for me because I'm the family. only one out of, yeah, out of my, everyone I know who didn't finish college. Yeah. And mm. also, I think my parents look at that as like, yeah. yeah so can you also see potentially how that has fueled your your the fire to like be seen a certain way especially as intelligent mm -hmm. <clears throat> because of the yeah. judgment you had towards yourself for not completing college you know I, again i definitely I grew, yeah i grew up in an african household so i relate yeah. like grades and education <laughs> like it was not a joke and you know like i also grew up in an environment where like there was shame around not finishing school or getting bad grades so i get that and while that was a reality for you perhaps there's a possibility to where your value isn't tied to that any longer yeah 100 percent, it's not <laughs> like, i mean right now it's not it does. I mean, whether I have a college degree or not, yeah, affects me zero right now at this moment. I can't tell you how many times I've shared your content and I've tagged you and I've shouted you out because of the level of genius when it comes to storytelling. I tell my friends about you. Like, I, it's like <clears throat> honestly, like I would not have known and I would not have cared if you went to college or not. It's more of mm -hmm. like the energy that I get from you, right? I won't even. I, honestly, I don't even see you as a know-it-all. I just see you as someone who's passionate about, mm -hmm. about putting out good work in the world that is deeply impactful. Mm -hmm. right? That's what I see. <clears throat> I can't speak for anybody else. So again, all the things underneath, I would not have known. But all the things mm -hmm. underneath are what is driving our behaviors. <laughs> and essentially, like what I've come to learn and realize and it's a lot of the work that i do with people is the things that are being driven from wounding have a limit and threshold because they force us to work beyond our capacity now what do i mean by that it's it's like flooring the gas pedal in a car going 120 miles an hour for as long as possible and thinking that that's going to last without needing to refuel. That's what happens when we're operating from wounding or parts of us that are still fragmented, parts of us that are still incomplete. We're, we're using more energy than we need to. Energy to protect, energy to suppress, energy to avoid. It's just energy that's being used to not meet those parts of us but we still believe to show up in the world a certain way. 
there's going to be a point where if we don't do it by choice, life is going to give us a reason to do it. And I've had many clients that have had the random accident or they've had the random breakup or they got terminated from their job randomly. You know, on a deeper level, I think what, what we know, what took place for those people was things just caught up to where they couldn't, they couldn't keep operating mm -hmm. the way that they did any longer. Right? It's only so long you could be driven by something that's fragile before, yeah. it, before it breaks. I actually know somebody who, who yeah. got into a random accident like that <laughs> yeah. after like overworking. Yeah. So, you know, I think. But what about like, what do you think like people like Michael Jordan or like, yeah. you know, Tiger Woods? Do you know what I mean? Like, do you think they're. Oh, yeah. They're pushing I mean, themselves <laughs> to the max. Like, <laughs> You ready? Why do you think yeah. Jordan? Why do you think Jordan's a gambler? Uh, why do you think Tiger Woods had that? Tiger scandal? Woods cheats, right? Like, why do you think he had that scandal? Yeah. <laughs> Is it yeah. you know? It, it's sure Jordan was Jordan. Don't take that away from him. Even I, Kobe, I, I think, also <laughs> same situation. It's like, right? Everyone has their thing. It has the threshold where the lack of authenticity or the lack of really not being yourself or the lack of, you know, operating from wounding will catch up because a lot of those actions essentially that are being driven from that place are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. They're dysfunctional in nature, right? <clears throat> it's not, I would yeah. tell, would you agree that it's, it's actually energetically draining to be, you know, be on the lookout? for a comment yeah. of someone that's going to attack your intelligence. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of like you just, oh, you know, this is who I am, whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. What I feel, I think I've gotten pretty good at it. Yes. But I think I, I so I, I've, so let me ask you, I have a few, few questions. Yes. Like, yes. so let's say, I do breath work, right? Yeah. It sounds like all of these things are happening not during the breath work session, but afterwards when you're like going out and living your life and where, when you're, you know, when you face these things, right? But is the breath work what's making you aware of those things? It's a good question. Or, so, and when I say, when we why say can't you do work, that without the breath work? You can. Oh. Oh, you, you can. Okay. You, you, yes. So what does the uh, breath work do? I, I was going to, I was going to get to that. You definitely can, but, or might I say, and what breath work allows you to do. I think one of the, one of the, the, the beautiful things about it, one, it's a, it's a beautiful health practice. I mean, when you're oxygenating your body and producing more red blood cells and yeah, Just there's like so much benefit. It's, yes. Yeah. It's physically, it's beautiful, but on a deeper level, for someone that is solely conditioned to operate from their head, like they're always in their head, for someone who has experienced deep trauma, <clears throat> for someone who's experienced PTSD, for someone who's experienced deep challenges where they are completely checked out, like they're living, they're, they're living in a way that doesn't want to come back to those things. Rightfully so. When the, someone is solely like they're there. delusional almost. I wouldn't say delusional, but <laughs> yeah, they're functioning. They're functioning in the world, right? But they're not themselves. But I mean, I, I, like, I, I, I feel like Steve Jobs is kind of delusional. We're all delusional, <laughs> though, aren't we? Okay. Hey, you're delusional to somebody, son. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, you're delusional to somebody, so we're all delusional. <laughs> Um, someone that's solely in their head, what breathwork helps could potentially help that person do is get out of their head and into the body and into the body, right? When we're there, we really don't have to do anything because the body is fully aware of exactly what to do on its own. We've just interrupted it. For instance, for example, if you were to cut like your hand or your finger or your like your toe or something, and you have like a wound there, 
<clears throat> what do you trust is going to happen over time? Gonna heal. Gonna heal. As long as you clean it and the environment is right and the conditions are proper, right? Healing will take place on its own. Do you have to do anything? No, you don't have to do anything. You trust. Oh, it's gonna heal. Well, that is that same principle exists not just through all life, but in us. We all have an innate mechanism that always wants to organize. It wants to come back to center, it wants to come back to homeostasis. Just like the cut is coming back into homeostasis or wholeness, when we experience, let's say, some type of emotional harm, the body wants to come back into homeostasis, but that highly depends on our ability to be with the pain. See, when you cut yourself, you still got to mm -hmm. deal with the pain. It's still painful a little bit while it's healing. Mm -hmm. Most of us have not... We, we, one, we have not been taught or brought up or shown how to be with the pain, or we haven't had, you know, people around us to witness us as we be with the pain. So because we're wired for survival, and the last thing we want to experience is pain, we interrupt the body's natural process of coming back into homeostasis. So over time, these consistent interruptions add up. It's like blowing in a balloon full of air until there's no more room and then it pops. And people experience that all the time. It's like the passive aggressive explosion or the, the random hitting of some, mm -hmm. like the ran yeah, it, it happens because we're not giving ourselves the space to release the pressure that we've been suppressing. So in a session, when the person's out of their head and they're in their body and they're breathing what's taking place, I mean, you know, just for the sake of confidentiality, like I'm not going to share like people's names and stuff, but what I see happen in a session still blows my mind. Still blows my mind. Physical expression, emotional expression, um, sometimes no expression. But these are all the ways that the body in some cases and in most cases is actually coming back into homeostasis, Right. And what that looks like is stopping what we interrupted either yesterday or 20 or 30 years ago. It's like I'm opening the door that yeah. I put in front of my ability to express. See, animals by nature do this. Animals literally, if an if antelope was being chased by a cheetah and it happened to escape and get away, right? Its ability to run and get away from the cheetah, right? It's flooded with all the hormones that are going to, that, that are, that are helping it get the to stress, safety, yeah. right? The stress hormones. So let's say it gets away and you have a bird's eye view of the antelope that got away. What you may begin to notice is that once the antelope is like, okay, coach, yeah, he doesn't care, right? you'll start to see it shake, uh. right? You'll start to see it shake. It's shaking off, right? It's tremoring. It's getting rid of the residue of that stressful situation. Uh. And once it does that, it's completing it. It's completing it in its brain. It's completing it in its body. And uh. next five minutes, it can go back to where uh. it almost just died. Yeah. Uh. But for humans, because we have the dignity of choice, we interrupt that. And once we interrupt it, it's funny, let's say, let's say, yeah, something traumatic happened to you. You went to a traumatic car accident, like, you know, on like Sunset and Roosevelt Boulevard or something like that. If it's still incomplete in you, every time you drive near there, you're going to feel something. Right. As a matter of fact, or like you, even whenever you get into a car. Yes. <laughs> right. Whenever you get into a car, whenever you cross an intersection, yeah. even you may not even want to drive close to it because that is yeah. still living in you. It's not complete yet. So a lot of this is being able to get out of the head, get out of the parts of us that are protecting us. Right. And get into the body where the body can resolve it on its own. All we need to do is create the conditions in space and the body. It's like the antelope shaking. 
the, the... <laughs> it'll literally do it itself. You know, we've gotten so far as human beings to think that we know more than what I consider the most, uh, most masterfully designed piece of technology that exists in the universe, which is the human body. Mm-hmm. We is still we still have not fully caught up to the magnitude of what this this yeah. skin suit can yeah. do, especially the brain. Yeah. Right, <laughs> especially the brain. So just like you cut yourself and you're going to experience pain but you know it's going to heal, same exact thing. It's like when you experience a cut emotionally, if you can learn to be with the pain that comes with it and make sure the conditions are right, then you'll heal. So what about, so let's say I keep doing breath work, like let's say every day or every, like periodically all the time, right? And every time I do it, it's healing, 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 healing it. So even if I don't, if I'm not aware of those triggers or like outside of the breath work session, yeah. would it would that eventually heal? The I trauma? mean, yeah. So, and this is it's it's complex. There's many nuances <laughs> to this. So, the first thing I'll say is, when we say breath work, breath work is just simply the conscious manipulation of our breath to be able to achieve and access certain states, right? Um, it could be a mood, it could be a certain state of consciousness, but that's typically what it is, right? Uh, I can go into the science of breath work. It's very extensive as it relates to the nervous system or relates to the brain. You know, um, one of my mentors, Linus, says the breath is a remote control to the nervous system, right? So mm-hmm. if you understand what the nervous system is, well, you pretty much have access to be able to dictate how you respond to life and to the world, right? So for instance, if somebody does comment that you're an asshole, like I said before, your nervous system, based on the modern world, will treat that like a saber-toothed tiger that was that 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 existed 10,000 years ago. Doesn't know the difference. It just knows that that feels life-threatening, but it's life-threatening to the identity an image that you're carrying about yourself. So it's not really life-threatening to who you really are. It's life-threatening to the thought of who you are, or in this case, the ego-driven identity. That's what it feels like a threat to. So when you can understand that, well, you can also use the breath to respond differently. You can also use the breath to lower, right, um, the chances of reacting in an unhealthy way. You can use the breath to slow down time, quote unquote, and begin to investigate or reflect on like why you would do that or why it is affecting you. And breath work is not just so much what's shown online, like catharsis. You see these people like going crazy and that's a part of it. You know, I also think it's very unhealthy to chase catharsis. Catharsis is like physical bodily expressions that seem very intense and uncontrollable. But that's only one aspect of expression, essentially. That's not all. And if that happens in a session, great. But in sessions with people, that's never the intention, right? The intention is most of the time to be present. And when you're present, if that comes as a result of that, great. You're welcoming that. But we're not looking for that, right? But breath work is not just these peak experiences. <clears throat> breath work or just breathing, you know, I don't even like to relate it as breath work anymore because we're not really working. The, you're just breathing. But for the context of this, breath work really matters outside of the big session how you're breathing every single day, Mm -hmm. how you choose to breathe when somebody curses you out or how you choose to breathe when, you know, you're celebrating your anniversary with your wife or how you choose to breathe when you got your highest paying client, how you choose to breathe when somebody cuts you off in the middle of the road or how you choose to breathe when someone leaves a hateful comment. That's where breath work really counts because in those moments, it's easy to check out and not be present. But those moments are really what dictate your experience as a human being. And to to experience anything, you got to be present for it, like to fully experience it, right? To live it. And the breath 
only invites us back to the present. So that's why it's so powerful. So for anybody that's listening or watching, you know, <clears throat> my, my invitation is not to be intimidated by breathwork, especially, you know, like it's becoming one of the fastest growing modalities out there right now. And it's very intimidating. There are a lot of people that are, that are resistant to it because, you know, there's probably like a, a very, um, it's a little cultish. There's a, there, yes. There's, there's, there's <laughs> like a cultish. Sitting in a tent. <laughs> yes. Like everybody's crying. <laughs> yes. So there's a cult like, you know, a uh, 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 pulse to it. There's this very ethereal pulse to it. But then there's the other side of it. You know, I, I have clients that, that hire me to help them work on their breathing as it relates to performance. Mm -hmm. Like athletes. You know what I mean? Or, or yeah. pregnant, pregnant, pregnant moms that, that yeah. need to know how to access their breath. So during labor, they're not, you know, they're present and they're able to kind of deal with the pain in a, in a, in a, in a more efficient way. Mm -hmm. So it's not just limited to what is being presented or shown. No, there's a wide scope of what breath work is, but ideally in the most simplest form, breath work is just your ability to breathe. And your ability to breathe can and will often impact how you respond to life, your ability to be resilient in the face of challenges. So that's typically. Is like it always. When you do breath work session, does it always yeah. bring up negative emotions <laughs> or does it ever bring up. So I've tried oh, breath yeah. work once. Yeah. And when I did it, so I did, I felt all the tingly, all that yes. stuff. I started crying like a baby. But so the, 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 what it brought up for me from my childhood was when I realized, like, I actually, instead of the negative stuff, it actually brought out this, like, yes. overwhelming sense of, like, being loved by my dad. Yeah. Like, it almost felt like, you know, like that, like, like I'm, like, he's hugging me and he's, like, holding me in his arm or something like that. Yeah. Which, which, which I completely, like, forgot about that, like, that kind of childhood. So it was a very positive experience for me, yes, actually. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. If I'm hearing your question correctly, um, yes. And, you know, I would even say there's no negative or positive, really. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's subjective. See, what was positive to you could be negative to somebody else. Because, for instance, I'm going to use an example and then come back to that. You have the tough guy that's always hard and yeah, that's my smiling, dad. yeah, and just uh, like militant, right? Mm -hmm. Again, there's a time and place for that. And I've 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 worked with these type of people. I think of one right now. And when we were when we were through, what we realized was when he was young, his mom got sick. And he was a very playful, joyful little like, child, like playful, like loved life, was curious. And his mom got sick and immediately he decided, well, this is not the time to be playful or joyful. He had to get serious. And he had younger siblings. So he couldn't be playful and joyful when his mom <clears throat> was sick, right? So that moment caused him to now be this serious militant, tough looking, scruffy guy. But deep down inside, mm -hmm. this most loving, caring human being. And for him, he built that identity because he thought, well, like over time, that's those are the people that he would attract people who love this tough, militant, you know, yeah. Like David Goggins or something. Yeah. <laughs> but re really, why he, why he came to work with me, he literally mm -hmm. said to Samson, I'm tired. I'm tired of always having to be the strong one. I'm tired of always... He was tired. He would sleep, but he couldn't rest because he always had to be on. So our work together was, was giving him the permission to like, like, like literally like let that narrative go and relax and release the judgment he has towards that. But also don't forget that he has access to be that guy whenever 
it's needed. Like nobody is fighting a war 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? At least on this part of the world, right? Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like, I don't have to be on guard all the time. But can I access it when I need to? Sure. But the state that I'm in most of the time, for me, gets to be loving, gets to be grounded, gets to be open. And if I can't access that, then nine times out of 10, it's because like, I think that there's a danger or a threat around. So to your question. Wait, so just to clarify. So whenever he, he yes. feels the playfulness coming out, like yes. the non-serious coming out, yes. he would actually, that's when he's, he, he would, would freeze. Shut it, he would shut it down. <laughs> yeah. He would shut it down because in his mind, he judged it as weak. So through, through, for him, through breath work, it's almost like letting that playful, like yes. being comfortable with that playful sight. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it, it wasn't just breath, right? Like breath is just a tool that we use to access these deeper parts of us. Most of it was the integration work after. Most of it was the choice to create new choices that fit the version of him that he wanted to embody in the world. <clears throat> he no longer wanted to be this, he no longer wanted to be seen solely as this tough guy, this militant guy. Mm -hmm. He had access to it. Like a, he can, he can go back mm -hmm. to, it. he's one of the baddest motherfuckers on the planet. Like it's like, <laughs> he's one of those guys you don't want to mess with. Right. But he didn't need to be that all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we were able to help him practice knowing that it's okay for him to, to like, to be loving, to be playful, to seek adventure again, to be creative. And it made him even more powerful to wield both sides of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I actually think that makes a lot of sense because when I did the breath work thing. Yeah. Because that, like me being loved by my dad is such yeah. a, it's a such a long distance memory. Like, yeah. it's, um, because I actually like rejected him for most of my life. And I'll, I actually blamed a lot of things on him. So mm -hmm. I made him the enemy, right? Yeah. So... That's why I didn't, I, it's almost like I suppressed the good memories I had of him. I relate. And then through, when I was doing breath work, it, it actually like, it, it was so, it was so beautiful when I did the breath yeah. work. It was. Yeah. And you know, what's powerful about that son? This is, this is why I say like the body and the body mind matrix always, it always knows what you need. Like, there's no amount of planning or right algorithm you could have computed or put into the system to help you bring that up for what you needed, right? So this is why I love this world because there is the intention, there is the there's the the technical logical aspect of it, but there's also the mystery and the magic on the other mm -hmm. side that makes it very and makes it a harmonious experience. But it knows what you need. It... Yes. So for instance, to answer your question, absolutely. Right. If you let's let's call them positive, you know, let's po call them positive experiences. Yes. I mean, people have experienced bliss um, personally uh, and for other people. I had a breathwork session where I laughed for, I think, 30 to 40 minutes straight. And every time I tried to stop it, I laughed more. And my mind, my because it was my mind that was trying to stop it because it was concerned. So I'm present in my body, but my mind's still online, like almost like looking out. So it was concerned with how I was being seen or perceived. So mm -hmm. it would try to stop laughing. And every time it tried to stop laughing, the body will laugh more mm -hmm. for like 30 to 40 minutes. And till this day, I don't create a story around it. I just say, that's what my body needed. And to be honest, knowing me then, because I took life so serious, I had to take it serious based on the level of challenges that my family went through. Like I needed to laugh for 30 to 40 minutes because deep down inside, mm -hmm. that's who I am. I'm this playful yeah, goofball yeah. who loves to laugh. But the world, I let the world harden me. Right. So just like, you know, the, the, the gentleman that I was able to support again, I put, I used to put mm -hmm. up this front, have it all together again, perfectionist, yeah. like serious, I can't be silly. Yeah. I can't be silly. 
I'm going to save the day. I'm a hero. And I'm like, no, mm. fuck that. That's it's exhausting. Mm. Right. There's so much anxiety that comes with that. Cause I'm always looking out like, Oh my God, am I, there's a fear that, that exists all the time with someone that's addicted and attached to wearing a mask. The fear is the fear of being found out. Exposed. Yeah. People are going to find out that I'm a fraud. And there's nothing more than we want to, to be rejected in that way. So for me, how I see it is, well, when you can understand that you're not consciously or intentionally being a fraud, in fact, you're not being a fraud, you're just doing, you just did what was available to you at the time to protect you from mm -hmm. hurt and rejection. And now that you're aware of it, choose different. Yeah. And it also makes it, that's, that's the thing I feel like, cause I, there, there are certain parts of me that are like that, where I've I kind of yeah. gotten mm -hmm. over that mask. And those, those are the things when I do make a mistake, I'll just, I, I, it's easy for yes. me to admit that I made a mistake or yes. <clears throat> apologize or something like that, where the, 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 the mask that I'm still wearing, those are the things where it's hard <laughs> yes. for me to say, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I don't. It's not a matter of wearing them or not. It's a matter of having a choice in the matter. When we did wear them, let's say in our childhood or growing up, when we did decide to create a persona or wear the mask, it wasn't by conscious choice. It was out of a reaction, right? It was to defend ourselves. So we didn't have a conscious choice in the matter. It was an unconscious protective and instinctual choice yeah. to do something that was going to protect us. So we weren't, we weren't consciously present in the matter. Breathing, right? Or other modalities outside of breathing, but namely breathing. Part of why it's so powerful is because it invites us back into the conscious moment. Like it invites us back consciously. It's like, wait a minute. Like when I breathe and I still do it. Sometimes I get caught up and I'm, I'm just moving in autopilot. And I'm like, when I take a breath, I realize like, whoa, okay. I got carried away there. So that's why I tell people, it's not so much about the big experiences, which are powerful. Like it, what I say, it's like, <laughs> I don't wholeheartedly like agree with this, but there is some truth to it. Like a breathwork session could be, not all the time, it could be years of therapy, one mm. session. Because there's no talking involved. Like talk therapy, yeah. It's not about talking. It's not about intellectualizing. It's not about thinking. I no, actually heard that before, like that. It's Yeah, because therapy still has, here's the thing, therapy has a benefit. I, I'm, not, I'm not one to criticize. I think everything has a time and place. Right. There was a time in my life where talk therapy did support me. It was a stepping stone to get me to where I'm at right now. So I'm not going to be there and talk down on it. There is a place for it. Um, and sometimes talk therapy could be limiting and could be another way to avoid or dance around the root yeah. and the issue of the of the I action. see that so much. Like, you know how when you say self, right? So like yes. today you kind of clarify what that means. Yes. Because like whenever somebody says self, I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Right? Like, or because I think that when somebody does say authentic self, usually mm -hmm. are the people who either went through talk therapy or coaching and they intellectually understand that. And what ends up happening is when they're like, Oh yeah, like I'm I'm just being myself, right? Yes. That's it's usually like a, the version of them that <laughs> yes. the ego version of them. It's another like mask. That. It's, it's yeah, another yeah. mask. <laughs> yeah. It's literally another mask. Let me, let me, let me, I'll tell you this much. The, our ego is so good at creating defenses that you won't even know that you're in one when <laughs> it happens. Like that's it because its main priority is ensuring that you don't die. Mm. Right. So when you think you're not wearing a mask, that's where you're probably wearing a yeah. mask. Right. You'll know when you're not 
because you don't have to talk about it. Mm. You're living it. You don't have to talk about being, oh, I'm being my authentic self. No, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, your energy is in living it. You know what I mean? People feel it from That's you. That's almost like why you're saying that we can't intellectualize it. We can't. We, no. it, when it's like when you're doing breath work, it's in your body. Your yes. body will know what to do. Like you don't yes. have to. Yes. I guess as soon as you try to control it with your brain, it's already going against it. Yeah. <laughs> like you're yeah. trying to stop laughing or something like that. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> truthfully, and, you know, I, I love that you brought back around like the the idea of self, you know, kind of how I've learned and how I was mentored around it is that there is the self, the lowercase s. This is the self that we formulated across, you know, our lives and namely a certain identity, right? The identity has a name. The identity thinks a certain way. The identity takes specific actions. The identity has certain mm -hmm. behaviors and habits. This is the identity. And most of the time, this identity is connected to something, right? It's connected to some event or some reason that you had to choose to be that way. And Truth of the matter is, the identity does serve a purpose, right? The reason why I, I, I always like sharing the a, a different perspective on seeing, for instance, like wearing a mask as a as a mechanism that was protecting you rather than something that was working against you or attacking you is because Everything in our system, our body, our mind is actually working for us, right? The whole you versus you narrative, mm -hmm. I think is bullshit because the, the, the only reason you're going against yourself is because you don't understand the intention of why. So when you know that, oh, I'm wearing this mask to protect myself mm -hmm. from rejection, then it's not an enemy anymore. It's oh, you were actually like supporting me. It's like a tool. Yeah. You were supporting me. Now, all I have to do is redirect your energy. So as it relates to the self, usually it's the identity. And most of the time, it's ego-driven. The ego is not a bad thing. It's not a wrong thing. Now, it depends. It highly depends on what's fueling your ego. It highly depends if your ego is serving itself. And again, if the ego is made for survival, well, then that's all it's going to think about is survival. So it's going to serve itself. Then there's the real self, the authentic self that we all talk about. The capital S. How I see it is this is the self that's connected to the heart, the soul, if you will. This is the, the deeper part of us that's more <clears throat> interested in fulfillment and growth and expansion is this deeper aspect of who we are that chooses to experience and live the entire spectrum and totality of what it's like to be a human, right? That's why it needs the human body to do so. The capital self isn't really concerned with how it's perceived mm -hmm. it's the ego that is mm -hmm. and usually when you're concerned it's because it's connected to some sort of wound or it's seeking to protect something so when we are ourselves it doesn't mean that the ego goes away no you actually want a healthy ego there is no concept or idea of who you are without an ego you need you, you mm -hmm. wouldn't be human without an ego it's just a matter of redirecting who and what is driving it most people including myself at one point <clears throat> were letting their ego drive so how it looked like for me was i was living from a place of survival because i had wounding that had not healed yet so I was worried about protection. I was worried about how I was perceived. Like I wasn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the time to live out who I was because I was more concerned with not being harmed. 
So once I complete and resolve and do my work on that and the shadow, as it's called, in the personal growth space, then I have the opportunity to now make my soul or my heart the driver of my choices that the ego makes. Now there's now a union. There's a harmony between the two versus a war. What takes place in most people is there's a war happening. There's a war between the ego that doesn't want to die, that's concerned about protecting and surviving, versus the soul and the heart that is here to live out its purpose or to live out its reason for being or to expand and, and grow. The soul is ready to jump off the cliff. The ego is like, fuck no, I'm going to yeah. die. <laughs> Right, so, so that we become like the gazelle, where yeah, yes. when we need the stress, it'll yes. kick in, and then when we're done, we'll shake it off. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's learning how to work with both of them. What I've come to find to be true for me is like living, not solely from my heart, but living from my heart to where my mind is a servant of it. See, most of us, our minds. The, you see, the mind was not meant to essentially be the leader. The mind is meant to be the support system. I think Einstein's quote, I'm going to look for it. Let me look it up. I'm going to look for it so I don't butcher it. Yes, <clears throat> Einstein said, um, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. So when we think about intuition, that's the part that's connected to the deeper aspect of us, the part that feels, the part that senses, right? And as we spoke about earlier, that's the part that actually has more access to information. Before the mind actually realizes anything, the body's already picked it up. That's why you can walk into a space and feel something's off immediately. And then by the time your mind gets to it, it either, mm. you know, hijacks it and you know causes you to doubt it but it happens all the time but being able to come back to this deeper aspect of ourselves our soul the heart and then let that lead and let the mind be the servant i i feel we'll start to see people experience truly fulfilling lives this doesn't mean we're going to be exempt from challenge or pain because these are inevitable no this would mean that we would be willing even in the fear, even in the doubt, even in the hesitation, we'd be willing to meet life because we now see that it's working for some sort of good for us. Like looking back on my life, I can happily and gratefully say I don't regret anything. Like if I were to share stories of my life, it's like, wait, what? I don't regret anything. I don't regret the parents that I had. I don't regret, I don't regret anything because change a millisecond about any of it, I won't be having this conversation with you right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But many people aren't there yet. Many people are not at that place to see life that way because they're still resisting actually fully experiencing the thing that they... What are some signs yeah. that, that where how I know that I'm getting <clears throat> closer to that versus further away like how do i know that it's yeah working? uh the first answer to that is you'll know and I, the, no and I, I i i say that i say that confidently because we you know sometimes and this is just again this is just my my observation sometimes we like to think that we don't have access to these 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 yeah. answers or these you know what i mean and we'll we'll place that upon somebody else or some some guru. No. Yeah, I need I need some I need some check check like step yes. by step guidance yes. on how I don't. Yes. <laughs> and I and I think a large part of that is because most of our world is hyper masculinized. And when I when I when I say hyper masculinized, I'm not talking about like hyper man or anything. I'm not talking I'm talking about the the masculine function and principle. 
which is concerned with logic, which is concerned with assertion, which yeah. is concerned with structure, which is concerned with thinking, right? right? And we've we've sort of been at a deficit with the other side, which is feeling, which is intuition, which is, you know, the dark, going into the darkness, which is uh, expression, creativity, right? Imagination. We've been so hyper-focused on one side that, Essentially, like our lives are starting to, we're starting to see it. We're starting to suffer as a collective and as a society because there's really no harmony between the two as it's supposed to be. But you'll know. And the reason you'll know is because you'll feel it. You have some sort of sign. Like the best way I could explain it is like certain things that normally would bother you don't bother you anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? Certain things that would normally trigger you don't trigger you anymore you start to be at peace with most things. And when I say peace, it's actually acceptance. So that's how you'll know. When you're more in the space of acceptance of what is rather than what it needs to be, what it should be, how it used to be, that's how you'll know, right? But the more we are in denial of reality, oh, it needs to be this way. It should be this way. Man, I wish it used to. No. I wish we can go back to how it used to be then that's when you're going to, we're going to keep con yeah. experiencing the suffering. So I feel essentially like that's, that's something that we get to aspire, aspire towards. How can we be more accepting of reality? How can we be more accepting of the moment without wishing it was different, without wishing that, that uh, it was any other way than what it, what it, what it is. And I forgot who said it, but someone said the reason that most people, ah, it was, it was, it was a mentor of mine about eight years ago. He said, the reason why most people suffer is because they are trying to change and manipulate things that are out of, out of their control. Right. And if you look at what irritates us more than anything is not being able to change or manipulate yeah. things that are outside of our control. Which brings me to Byron Katie. Um, she's an author in the personal growth space. And she said there are three types of businesses that we deal with. She said there's my business, there's your business, and there's God's business. My business are the things that are within my control, which is my thoughts, my feelings, my actions, my behaviors, my habits. Your business is everything, right? Same thing, but for you. And God's business is everything else. Every time I step out of my business into somebody else's business, I experience challenge. I experience suffering. I experience irritation. Like things don't feel right because i'm out of my business but when i could invest majority of my energy <clears throat> in taking care of my business meaning that i'm taking care of me mm -hmm. when i take care of me that's who you're getting when you take care of you that's who i'm getting and everything else i can't control anyway mm -hmm. right I can't it's usually the opposite. Yeah. We we try to control everything else except everything. our own. <laughs> everything. Somebody said this thing to me, and it's like, oh, I wish they would have said this. Yeah. Well, they said that. And the thing is, if you take it personal, it's actually not them. It's yeah. it's me. So that's why I, I I just the closer I can get to acceptance, life feels a bit more peaceful. Not saying chaos isn't there. It's just. Mm -hmm. I, I am more resilient in the chaos to where it doesn't it doesn't really affect me. And that makes sense. I have one last question. Absolutely. I, and I think I think I kind of know the answer, like based on this <laughs> talk. But you know, do you, you ever have like these ident two conflicting identities where you, when you're in front of this group of people, mm -hmm. you have this identity and you so and it might be the opposite. Like here. You might be like the strict boss or something like that. Yeah. And in front of your kids, you're like the silly dad or something like that. And you're completely okay with this. 
and okay with that. Like, how how does like how does it resolve that? Like, you know, that's a that's a good question, and I've had to do that before. I was a shapeshifter, you know, <clears throat> because um, you're not rejecting. Let's say you're the silly person here. Yeah. You're not necessarily rejecting that here, right? Because you know that you can be this person. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And then when you're here, you know that you can be this person. So you're not really rejecting yeah. those things. Yeah. Yeah. But because you're not rejecting it doesn't change the fact that you have to act different in two different spaces. So <clears throat> the reason I bring that up is because why would I need to be different for this person and this person? Why can't I just be who I am in all spaces? And that's normally <clears throat> the work for a lot of people. That was my work. And the reason I had to change so much, it was because it was the judgments I had towards myself. I didn't trust myself to be myself in here and over here because over here, I had mm -hmm. to be a people pleaser because I know what I was going to get here. Over here, I had to be a perfectionist because I knew I was going to get here. But it was all an act. And it was an act that had to be put on because I feared being criticized, rejected. And most and first and foremost, I feared love being taken away from me because of my upbringing as a kid, right? So I, I had to be someone different. Now, if someone finds... You know, if someone could energetically do that for the rest of their life, kudos to them. But what I know from experience, it's exhausting, son. It's very exhausting to have to change all the time, to have to act and knowing that that's not myself. And here's why that's actually more detrimental than anything. If I have to be someone else in front of my boss, now my boss thinks that's who I am. So the relationship I have with them is not real. If mm -hmm. I have to be... Uh, um, a nice guy with this friend over here well the friend is having a relationship with the mask and the persona not me so it's a disservice to everybody so for me what I had to do was learn how to accept myself accept that sometimes I'm not a good person sometimes you know I exhibit not so good behaviors that doesn't mean I do them or I express them, but I have the capacity to, to, to do that. I had to accept that I am a good person. I had to accept that I do have value to give. I had to accept that, that I do, that, that, that I am intelligent, right? I had to accept the totality of myself. And now when I walk in rooms, I'm, I'm me. Right? Like the me that you get on social media, you know, guarantee you, depending on the day that I have, right, is going to be the me that you get when I'm with you in person. And for me, that's always, I don't even want to call it a goal. Like that's how I want to live my life. And if, if you can't, if you're not supposed to like, you can't deal with it, great. Like we're not all supposed to like, like each other. I think yeah. that's, that's a reality we have to face. I've gotten many times to my face that, yo, you're intense. And in the past, that used to affect me because I judged my own intensity. Now that I have accepted it, I'm like, you're intense. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank you very much, you know, because I see that as a quality. Now, that actually I reminded me, like, um, so you know how, like, at least for me, when I'm at home at my yeah. most comfortable place around my wife and my closest people, that's like, that's when I don't feel the need to pretend to yes. be anything, right? It's like, yes. Versus like, even if I go a step outside, you know, just, you know, yes. even other friends that are not as close, maybe I'll act slightly different, right? That's fine. <laughs> or something that's like fine. that. Do you think that me at home at my most comfortable state, is that, what my authentic self is i mean i would, I would have to ask you do you mm. do you feel that's what it is how does it feel when you're i mean because i'm not trying to i'm not trying to put on a mask for my wife <laughs> like she knows every little <laughs> i was like you can't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you can't if you try she knows all of my flaws all yes. of my 
Yes. Ups and downs and everything. Yes. So, yes. you know, I guess some people don't like some people hide stuff from their true, <laughs> spouse. True, true. I, agree. I agree. But me and my wife is like, we're, we've been through like hell and back. Yeah. So she's seen it all. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. <clears throat> um, so there, there are layers to this. So again, I would ask you, it's, it's how you feel. If you feel like if you, if it feels expansive and, and, and clear in you, and it feels like you're, you're not performing, then that's closer to who you are than anything else. Mm -hmm. I, I, okay. As you were saying that, like, I, <laughs> I kind of, yeah. that kind of answered my question because yeah, there are actually times when I don't feel like, uh, you know, there are certain, certain times when, um, maybe I'll be mean to her or something like that. Yeah. And I, I, I do feel uncomfortable afterwards. Again, I yeah. don't, I don't admit to it right away. Like I, yeah. my ego will be like, no, exactly. she's wrong. Exactly. And then like an hour later, I'll be like, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there are definitely times when I, I don't yeah. feel that. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, one of the, one of the greatest references for me that has supported me in like reflecting or checking in to see if I'm able to like if I'm if I am being like me is the connection I have to my heart if I'm in my heart then I'm me mm -hmm. it's you know and that example just what you just shared about your wife like that that brought that up for me because being in our heart is <clears throat> is the world of also being human like the the heart can feel just about everything the ego doesn't want to feel the ego is more concerned with being right the heart wants to be free the heart wants to feel receive and give love that's it the ego wants to be right mm -hmm. so when you were sharing about your wife saying that oh you say something mean to her and you didn't want to admit it right away. That's, mm -hmm. that's the ego's judgment. It's like, no, I need to be right. I need to be right. Mm -hmm. See, that's the performance. That's the, again, that's the masks. That's the persona. Mm -hmm. That's the identity. The heart's not concerned with any of that. The heart wants to be free. The heart wants to give love. It wants to receive love. Right? So moving into the heart, right, is challenging for the ego. As a good friend would say, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> a win for the soul, right? A good day for the soul and the heart is a bad day for the ego, mm -hmm. right? So the more I can lean or the more I can reference and feel my heart, then I know I'm closer to being me. Now, this is not to say that masks are like bad things. When we look at them as what they are, you know, we may have put them on, we may have worn them, we may have formulated these identities in a time where that was the only choice we had in order to protect ourselves from danger, hmm. right? in order to not feel rejection. Mm -hmm. But once we become aware, awareness brings back our dignity of choice. See, back then we didn't really choose it because we weren't aware. Now we are aware that we can choose it. It depends. It's very situational. Like you may still be in the connection phase with a new friend and you're still getting to know each other, right? And as the connection builds, like then the layers come off, mm -hmm. right? I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's mm -hmm. wrong. I think it's actually probably wise i wouldn't call sometimes it you might have to deal yes. with a narcissist or something or yeah, yeah. where you have to you, protect you, yourself <laughs> you, you you yeah you don't you don't know so well i wouldn't even call it a mask it's 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 yeah. it's your systems feeling them out because here's also what's taking place believe it or not but that i feel like can help them from intuition too because sometimes you meet yes. somebody and you feel you, yes 
you don't know why, but you feel there's like a red flag. Yes. <laughs> Some, yes. But you can't really pinpoint why. <laughs> yes, that's that's what I was getting to. So, you know, there's a lot of nonverbal cues that are going on. Mm -hmm. That our system is picking up like faster than the mind can even grasp. Mm -hmm. Your body is picking up on everything. And I'm a firm believer in your mind, you get to question. But your body, it knows. The, the, the body knows 100% of the time. Where the mind question, the body knows. So if your body gets a feeling that something's off, just I would just say take a moment. Be more discerning. But here's the issue with that. This is back to breath and back to doing this work. Most people don't even have a connection or relationship with their body. Yeah. So it's why people end up in dynamics with a lot of red flags yeah. because their intuition is shut off to where they can't even pick it up. Mm -hmm. So their mind is overriding their body. And before they know it, oh, Man, I should yeah. not have been in this situation, yeah. but your intuition knew that. I did it again. Long... <laughs> I did. I did I did because like that, that that's happened to me so many times where I, I I make the same repeated mistakes over and over. And it's like, and my wife is like very actually she she's yeah. very intuitive. They usually are. So she'll she'll tell me like she'll tell me like uh like I don't know if you should trust that guy or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, no, it's fine. Like, <laughs> you know, like, and, and and I think that, and then like it turned out that she was right or something like that. And it's, and then, and then I will make the same mistake again. And I, I think I'm, I live yeah. in my head a lot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what's, what's good about that. So we, we, we all have, you know, we all have an intuition. We all have access to it. Doesn't mean that we use it or doesn't mean that we all listen to it. Um, just like we both, both men and women have masculine and feminine qualities and functions within them. But when it comes to like a union, for instance, and I got counsel on this from like couples that were married for like decades, years, and just older people. Um, most of the time, right? Not all the time. The women because it's more feminine in nature, not limited to gender, but it's more feminine in nature and women are more feminine than men, right? They have access to their intuition more than men normally would. I was fortunate, right? You know, <clears throat> and I realized it at eight years old and I thank my parents for not like, you know, um, demonizing it in me and i think it's because of you know the how spiritual we were as a family so that stayed online so i've always had access to it right but i think everyone does but the point i was getting at is what you know this counsel the counsel that i got was if you have questions about something especially if, if you're in a relationship or you're you're married um and this has always been proven to be true. Ask your wife. <laughs> Ask your wife. Because, <laughs> again, bro, I don't know how. And I don't claim to know how. Mm -hmm. But they usually, they, they are on top mm -hmm. of it. They see things that we don't. Right? And that's why. You but know, it's also our ego that's like, no, I don't know how to ask. <laughs> and we, we, we actually have stronger, we have stronger egos. So that, that's why. That's why we. Again, more masculine, we're more, we're more logical, we're more reason, we're more, yeah. you know, rational. So we won't look for all those things. Uh, but if you do have a strong connection to your intuition and people can access that, if their body is clear and, you know, they're in connection with it, they can access it, they can yeah. feel it. But yeah. I'm dude, actually going to say, like, I, I think my wife has a lot to do with me breaking down my ego and and making me realize those mm. you know because now because like she's also very um she's intuitive and she's also very non-judgmental yeah. so 
naturally. So what happens is when I'm acting up or I'm throwing a tantrum or something like that, like she'll just she you know she won't like fight back. She'll actually kind of yeah. she'll know know what to say. It's like oh yeah, like oh you want me to help you with that or whatever. Like she'll actually kind of try to accommodate me. And the fact that she's done it multiple times and like saw the outcome of that, that's what makes me actually realize what I, that I was wrong. Mm. And it was my ego acting up. And then mm. after repeated pattern of that, now I'm like happy to ac accept that. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and what's what's powerful about that? I think she, you know, she was just she was loving. Yeah. Usually when, when there's no environment, when there's no environment and by the way, that's like, I think you're blessed to have someone like that. <laughs> I really do. You know, it's I, like, <laughs> there are a lot of dynamics and I've been in them where it's, it's the reaction feeds, the reaction feeds, the reaction. Yeah, exactly. Reaction, yeah. Reaction. And then, Cause I've had relationships like that over and over and over before her. Yeah. 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 And the beauty of that is like, at the end of the day, I feel a lot of us just want to be loved. We want to give it and we want to receive it. Mm. And a lot of people don't know what that feels like. You know, their perception of love came with pain, so they protect themselves from it, you know. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I see it a lot in my work. And it's taken a level of being able to go there within myself because that's, that's what I wanted. I just wanted love. But it's being able to go there within myself and be able to provide that for myself that has me be in the space to not judge anyone. <clears throat> because that's what people fear the most. They can't be themselves because they fear judgment. They mm -hmm. fear judgment because they fear being rejected. And rejection, <clears throat> uh, it, it provokes and irritates and triggers our sense of belonging. We all have a deep, tribal, very ancient right? Need to belong. Like <clears throat> we want to belong to a tribe. We want to belong to a community. You know, back then, if you did not belong, that meant death. You were ostracized. Yeah. So nobody wants to be ostracized. In fact, I think why we have that sense, why it's wired into us, because it's also showing like survival that, mechanism. Yeah. Well, yes. And I think it shows that we need people. There's no yeah. way Sun could be Sun and Samson could be yeah. Samson. There's no way I could understand who I am without other people. Hmm. In fact, people play a role That's of mirroring back to me myself so I can understand myself. That's true. So, In, <clears throat> yeah. You know, I'm like a really super introvert. So I've I've gone like, weeks without talking to anyone and 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 be fine but then when the pandemic happened and like it it literally got to a point where i feel like i need to be around somebody or around wow. some people and so what i think was, like what was the difference what was the difference between that i don't know maybe just like i don't know i just i just felt this like need to even just go to the store and just talk to a random stranger or something like that. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I think, oh, this is this is actually really good. I think, I mean, what I what I'm seeing, could it be? Because again, uh, I have moments where I'm introverted. Like I have my hermit phase. I actually I love being in my own energy. I, I'm a, I'm a homebody most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also extroverted. Like so, there there's there's, there's a time and place for both. But as I'm hearing you say that, could it be because when you choose to be introverted, it's by choice. So when you when you decide not to be introverted anymore, you can go back and be with people. And the pandemic kind of took that away from everybody. And you didn't really. Oh, uh, I see what you mean. You yeah, you was, I was freely, forced to be. Yeah. Yes, you were forced to be introvert and you didn't choose to be. So could, could yeah. that be could that be why? Maybe. Yeah. That's interesting. Also, like I, I also think it's like the duration because Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when I when I when I stayed home by myself, it was like me playing video games for like days. Like it, it was like it wasn't like <laughs> yeah. for a long period of time, but with the pandemic yeah. it was it was kinda long. So I just yeah. naturally missed just seeing another human face. <laughs> 
Yeah, man. Like the, when you say like we need humans, like I, I really do believe that. Actually, after the pandemic, I truly believe that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, you know, this work has taught me that too. Like in these sessions, you know, I don't, you know, I, I really don't do much except facilitate and make sure the environment and the conditions are great. And all I do is guide people back to themselves to do what they were already going to do. But the biggest thing in it is that when this person is experiencing or expressing, you know, for instance, like tears from a memory of your father loving you, you know, especially a memory that you've like lodged away or suppressed, or you did not want to experience because of whatever narrative you have around it. Oftentimes we suppress this because we have judgments about them, right? Well, as someone that's guiding someone, I'm coming in non-judgmentally. And when they realize that they can cry or yell or scream or laugh or experience joy or bliss, all the parts of them that they've managed to suppress and hide, when those parts come up and they have someone that's not judging it for them, mm -hmm. what that communicates that it's, oh, like it's okay to be this. It's okay to feel this. It's okay to experience this. And that's one of the most powerful shifts that takes place. So healing or coming back into wholeness is great doing it by yourself. But if you don't have no point of reference mm -hmm. to actually reflect back to you how true it is, then how would you? It's really like almost like a confirmation. Yes. Like, yeah. You need people to yeah. see you. Yeah. We, don't need, we don't need them to see us, but you need them to see you as a way to confirm within mm. yourself that it's okay to be that. So we're all witnessing. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. We're all witnessing each other. So uh, that's why a part of this too is like really learning that, yeah, that's why we, we, need, we want to belong so bad. But it's important to feel a sense of belonging from a place in you that's healthy rather than this desperate, wounded place. Because then you end up just belonging. That's how gangs happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's how you know, uh, extreme cults take place is because people want to belong to something, but they end up because they're not, yeah. not in, they're wounded. They end up being drawn into something that's actually more dangerous than anything. Yeah. Like belonging with your authentic self rather than belonging with the mask on or something. Yes. Like that. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that, I just think about the young kid that that joins a gang because he's yeah. accepted nowhere else. Yeah. But but there. That's true. So he'll do he'll do anything. He'll become anyone to do that. Yeah, man. And cults. <laughs> <laughs> um I like, yeah. I, mean, the... I, I like cults be cults. I mean cults, <laughs> cults are just cultures. They're just really extreme. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh that's what uh like my yoga teacher yeah. always says. Cult comes from the word culture <laughs> culture yeah. yeah um yeah i mean i think i think uh this this was really thoughtful and thank you for going so deep and of course of course um, so if somebody wants to like work with you or yeah. join your sessions like how do they do that yeah. i mean Where one of the go? one of the greatest places to, to reach out to me is on um, instagram you know for me awesome. it's like creating dialogue with them and then you know, we'll have a conversation and then there's there's uh yeah there's ways that we can connect and work which you know intake forms to fill out but i like to talk to people and connect with them first and then see if it's even a good fit first and foremost you know so Instagram. i'll put all your information in the Absolutely. in the links and everything yeah. thank you again uh yeah. great seeing you you too are you yeah. still in austin it's been yeah i'm in austin we should get together wait what yeah. <laughs> you've been here this whole time yeah okay uh, yeah yeah so it's we'll, been too we'll, long we got to get together for sure uh, yeah. yeah i appreciate you man thank you sir awesome. thank you everyone for listening and peace out take care